Hey, everybody, it's Chuck Arfine. Welcome to the White Sox Talk Podcast. It is brought to you by our great friends at Wintrust. Okay, Chris Getz said he wanted to bring in some people from outside the organization to help turn the White Sox around. Well, he's done just that with his first three hires since becoming the general manager. Josh Barfield, Brian Bannister, and Gene Watson coming from the Dimebacks, the Giants, and, of course, the Royals. So who are they? What will they bring to the table? Ryan McGuffey is going to join me to talk about these new additions. And I've got one more topic, and it is this. Are you willing? I should actually ask this to myself. Am I willing to believe again in Yoan Moncada? This could be a 30-second conversation or a 30-minute conversation or maybe a three-second conversation. It's that and more. Guff can't believe this is going to be in the pod. It's next. All right, Ryan McGuffey, wearing your Cody's hat. If you're oh, watching tis on YouTube. Tis the season. <laughs> Cody's public house in Lakeview. It's a good spot. Right, right. Friend of the program. Yes. So as we tape this, it is. Uh, you're listening to this on a Thursday, right after the White Sox lost another series. They're only 0-10-2 in series since August. Uh, they have money, to- so... Good for you. Good just, for you. Just saying. Well, the smart money is against the White Sox, clearly, the way they've been playing. Uh, they need to go five and four now. Five and four to avoid losing a hundred. Can you bet that? You could have. You could oh, really? have bet they were plus one fifty a couple of weeks ago, uh mid actually when they won their last series, which was against the Yankees mm-hmm. in early August. You could bet a hundred losses plus one fifty. And they were already looking for, like, it, it felt like it was a little out of reach then, but not irrealistic. And now it's, this is a, a foregone conclusion at this point. Yeah. You know, and I'm racking my brain thinking, like, how can they turn this around relatively quickly? Chris Getz, he's got uh, a lot of work to do, and we are starting to see how he is planning on doing it, certainly from a front office standpoint, uh, hiring three people uh, without White Sox. DNA. What do you think about that? Oh, I love that. I mean, I've been clamoring for that for the last two decades. So, you know, of course, there's one from the Royals in there, which, you know, you got to how, how can we not have somebody? I, I it's, it's, it's at this point where if I was deciding between two people and one was a Royal and one wasn't, I just wouldn't choose the other person. As silly as I, that I, might I, sound. Like, I know I would be like, oh, you're a ball boy. Uh and you're not with the Royals, you're in. Yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> I, I mean, like, uh, uh, tabling that one, I like where they organize, I like the organizations that they're coming from, you know? Yeah. I, I like the thinking of those organizations. They do it differently. I mean, you look at the Diamondbacks. Look at, like, this, the team they have this year is full mm-hmm. of drafted, farm, homegrown prospect type players that they either acquired via trade when they were trading veterans or they drafted smart and took their time to develop. And now you look at the Diamondbacks and they're going to be a very attractive team in the future. I'm not going to say that they're the Orioles, but in in the West, like you look at the Padres are kind of a mess. Like that's, I, I love, I mean, you look at their, their farm system in the last five to 10 years, Chuck, and the Diamondbacks always seem to have four to five guys in the top 100. And now Barfield's here with the White Sox. And I, I don't know if it's going to equate success. None of these hires are instant, instantly going to make the White Sox great. Like, let's, yeah, we all know that. We, we're going to preface that. But certainly getting people who are not from the, from the White Sox, people who did not, who've never been with the White Sox, who weren't players with the White Sox, weren't in development, weren't in scouting, weren't in coaching uh, with the White Sox. This team needs, my God, do they need outside the box thinking that's from outside of 35th and Shields. And at least, at least Chris Getz is doing his due diligence and bringing in those type of people from organizations. You look at the Giants even. Uh, they're full of analytics. I mean, Gabe Kapler is like the king of analytical managing, and they're 
They had a 107 win season two years ago. They have been in the playoff mix all season long this year. And you look at that roster and you're like, wow. So yeah. again, I, I I'm all for it. I, I it's, it's, it's hard not to like out, you know, outside the organization hires. Yeah, so Josh Barfield, assistant GM. That's his new role with the White Sox. He ran the Diamondbacks minor league system since 2019. Uh, they've been in the top 10 uh, since 2020, but, you know, under his watch, but uh, fell to 12th in the latest rankings in August. Uh, they've got a homegrown outfield, Corbin Carroll, Alec Thomas, Jake McCarthy. You know, we can go back and forth. Well, how much did he have to do with that? How much did Chris Getz have to do with the White Sox farm system and the guys that were able to uh, get to the majors or not? So, you know, we're going to find out. I'd like to think that uh, the Diamondbacks front office was working better than the White Sox. So Barfield was uh, probably responsible for a lot of that. We will get Barfield on the podcast eventually so we can talk to him. Um, But you know what I like about him? I mean, among many other things. Well, his dad... But also he himself was a top 20 prospect. Here's a guy, right, who when he talks to these prospects can say, I know exactly what you're going through right now. When he talks to Colson Montgomery, this is, he can say, hey, yeah, I was you. I know exactly how you are feeling right now with, you know, from a mental standpoint of, yeah, you know where you are ranked in terms of, you know, it's on the internet that people know about and the expectations for me and whether I'm meeting them or not. I like that about him. And that's what I like about Chris. I think that we talked about that. Yeah. Like he's got, it's an uphill battle, right? Because he was an unpopular hire, but now he's paired himself with another guy that Chris wasn't a first round pick, but he was a six round pick. And that's a high mm-hmm. draft pick, to be honest with you. These are two guys that have now played the game that are in these seats in the GM and assistant GM role. Now, Kenny Williams obviously played the game and had that background, but like Kenny strengths, usually I I thought Kenny strengths were player based, meaning he understood the grind and how to get to the, when, when guys were down and when they're riding a streak, when they're not, you can't replicate that. If you didn't play the game, you just can't. And the fact that, like you said, I love the fact that he's a top 20 pick. He understands the top 20 prospect, top 20 prospect. Yeah, yeah. Top 20 prospect and knowing how much value, you know, I, I'd say how much overvalue is placed on prospects. You know, the way we look at prospects, I mean, certainly the white Sox catastrophically failed in all of their guys. And there are organizations who hit on all of them, but we know they're not going to hit. I, I, I do like, I really do like the pairings that Chris has done with guys that actually have baseball backgrounds, that they're not just, you know, putting it in an, an equation and an algorithm and spitting out some kind of, well, here's what this guy's worth. And you can't see it on the back of a baseball card. I, I, I think there's value in that. It doesn't, does it equal wins and losses? Not really, but it is a, there's a different uh, layer there. That's all I'm it's saying. A, it's a diff, it, there's a relation layer that you could truly, understand you might be able to understand a little bit more when you peel the onion Mm -hmm. of what a guy is going through or who a guy is when you're trying to figure out if you're going to draft x or y so brian bannister has been hired he is the son of floyd bannister who was a part of the winning ugly white Sox in 83 uh yeah and there's a connection there with the royals he played with the royals from like i think 2007 to 2010 Uh, he was the director of pitching for the giants they hired him away from the Red Sox. He was the VP of pitching development for them from 2016 to 2019. They won a World Series in 2018. So uh, he was providing information for Chris Sale, Rick Porcello, Eduardo Rodriguez, Nathan Navaldi, Craig Kimbrell, Joe Kelly. Um, and if you're wondering, he's not going to be the pitching coach. He's going to be in the front office providing analytics. Uh, he worked with Ethan Katz. And before we break it down... Uh, Brian Kenny interviewed Brian Bannister uh, on MLB Network last year, and uh, he gave a great couple of answers about what he does and what he brings to the table as the director of pitching, and this will be coming to the White Sox. Roll tape. I think Andrew Bailey, our pitching coach, says it best. We're the consultants for the player. Uh, we're, we're not so much <clears throat> a coach 
we're there to help them make good business decisions for their careers. And uh, he repeats that mantra often. And I think it's very true. Uh, the players ultimately get the final say and what they do on the field and how they practice, but we make the best suggestions possible, leveraging the information we have and leveraging our experience. Uh, but just meeting them halfway and giving them the freedom to uh, ultimately do what's best for their career, I think gets uh, the best possible product on the field. You know, back in 2016, when I got added to the Red Sox staff as a major league coach, uh, the first thing we did was throw as many high fastballs as possible. And we had the best ERA in the league for the rest of the season. And so it really doesn't matter what the, uh, the strategy is. It just matters that the rest of the league isn't doing it and it represents an advantage. And I think that's, what's fun about collaborating with the analysts and collaborating with the front office is, is finding that next thing and zigging when they're zagging or, uh, looking at something that's the market has created an inefficiency in and, and other teams are overpaying for another attribute. And just being willing to go the other direction and have faith in your coaching staff and the players that they can go out and execute. All right. So, Guff, here's Brian Bannister, who has you know been ahead of the curve in many ways in terms of analytics with pitching. And the White Sox can certainly use that. Uh, they've never even had a director of pitching. I just look at that. You know, I mean, where, where yeah. the White Sox have been. I mean, the the Red Sox have had one since uh, he was the Red Sox guy since 2016. It was Don Cooper to Ethan Katz, and you guys figure it out. <laughs> well, well, Chuck, I mean, in large part, that's why we're here. I mean, mm -hmm. th because the White Sox have been playing from behind, and it's self-inflicted. Yeah. They have refused. They have, they've had smaller analytical departments. They've had the smallest in the game. They had different scouting, old-school approaches. And they have the pitching lab and stuff like that now that other teams don't. And that's good. But in order to like, look, if you're not going to go out and sign the best players in the game, which the White Sox aren't going to do, they're not going to sign the $400 million player. Right. I think it's evident. Then you've got to figure out the cheat code. Yeah. The Tampa Bay Rays have figured out the cheat code. The San Francisco Giants, who do spend money, but they don't, they seem, they're not a popular, they figured out the cheat code. Mm -hmm. There are other organizations, the Baltimore Orioles figured out the, but the Rays obviously are there. They're forever and always going to be the example. Even the Oakland A's be, like, if you go back to those winning Oakland A's teams in, in some of the teams, even 2020, we we'll just watch money. When, when Liam Hendricks was shoving it up the white Sox, butt. Oh yeah. Those teams had the cheat code because they identified who they wanted to be and who they were. And that they, if, if they weren't going to have the best player in the game, they were going to have the best group of guys on in, on the field, and they were going to be doing things differently. The thing I loved about Bannister, the zig and zag, you and I use that a lot together yeah. when, when, when we do stuff. They're going to be zigging while everyone else is zagging. That's the shit we haven't heard from the White Sox. We've really actually never heard that at all. Yeah. They are either trying to follow everybody else or it's just confusing, and they're running it back again and again and again and again. And, you know, for the first time ever, maybe, maybe this approach, and I, I don't think it's going to equal anything in 2024, but I'm talking about as, as Chris Getz is building this thing, maybe the White Sox five years from now, just maybe, and I'm, I'm, I'm holding out hope here, will be that team that everyone else is like, what are they doing differently? Or what are they doing that we're not? Because I could tell you right now, they've always been the example where people are like, well, the White Sox don't do it that way. And maybe that's different. Maybe that'll yeah. change them. So who is Brian Bannister? So I found this article from uh, a few years ago, and he was talking about when he was a player in 2008 with the Royals, him and Zach Granke were teammates, and they were at the forefront of pitching analytics in 2008. I'm taking this from this article. Though most pitchers on their team and other teams ignored the data they were, data they were given in 2008, Bannister and Grinky could not get enough of it. They wanted to understand how their pitches worked and what they might do to improve them. They began to conduct impromptu experiments, manipulating the data as best they could. Bannister would study the greats of the game to identify the characteristics that set the greats apart from the also-rans like himself. I mean, he only threw in the high 80s. So here's a quote from Bannister from this article. If you want to learn 
Oh my God, Ozzy, uh, Guff, you're going to love this. I almost called you Ozzy. If you want to learn how to build an iPhone, you smash it to pieces and you look what's inside. He continues. Mm-hmm. I take all the best pitchers in the game and look how their pitches moved and then look at how mine didn't move. And I was like, wow, for me, it just established this gap between the physical talent and ability of the best pitchers. Then I'd get into how do I maximize the stuff I have? It's telling me I don't spin the ball very fast. I don't throw very hard. I don't create good angles. What do I do well? And that would lead him down a search of like, how do I maximize what I can with what I have? That's who the White Sox are hiring. And uh, that's really, really needed on any team. And I'm glad it's the Sox. Well, again, go back to the interview that we played. You know, I liked what he said about when he went to Boston. He looked at what they were doing. He's like, all right, we're going to throw more fat, high fastballs mm-hmm. than any other team. And they did. And what they did. And they also was, had, a, they had, they had a bunch of fireballs who could do it, but he knew what, how to maximize his team with the, exactly. with the talent they have. That's, and again, I, I love, it's like, we're going to do everything to make you successful. But when it comes time to go pitch, you have to be the guy who pitches. Correct. That's, like that's the kind of stuff. I mean, Justin Fields is sitting here in front of a media now to, to bring football into the to the context about that he feels too robotic, that he feels like there's too many messages on game day from coaches in his head. What Bannister's telling you is we are going to give you a ton of information and we're going to try to say the best thing you the best thing we think you can do is this. But on every fifth day, it you have to use your talent to pitch. And they know they're going to have bad starts and they're not going to feel good out of the pen. And there are going to be days where they can throw no hitters. But the fact that he said, and again, this comes from playing Chuck. This is why I think it it does matter sometimes. And if this is going to be the approach, give me the guy who the analytical guy who actually had success and failure, a lot of failure in the big leagues. And is trying to break the iPhone to figure out who he has in the white Sox rotation, which as we know, has more questions than answers right now. The other guy they added was Gene Watson. He worked for the Royals for all but one season since 2006. He's a longtime scout and evaluator. He also worked for the Padres, Braves, and Marlins going back to 1997. And uh, I do hope Gene Watson can be an amazing addition to this front office. It's just that he's got a little Royal stink on him because of all that's (laughs) come, all who have come before him. And, I love uh, that this. I, and I Pedro Gafal was raving about him. Oh yeah, well that's that, that's reason for me to run. Uh, <laughs> I, I love that the Gene Watson part of the podcast is basically an afterthought. And, oh, by the way, good the luck, third guy. I mean, we hope you, we we do look change the narrative. How about that? Change the narrative. I, I, I'll share. If you're hire, sh- if you're keep hiring Reds uh, Royals guys. Change the narrative. At some point, you got to get one that's good. It's yeah, so I'll cool. check. Uh, uh, <laughs> here's a text I got from I, I texted someone who knows him. He goes, Gene Watson's a really good guy. He's one of those baseball lifers that everybody's everybody loves. I don't know how good he is at his job, but he's a great guy. And I texted back. I go, sounds like the Sox did good in the great guy department. <laughs> he's a great guy. Oh my <laughs> god. What a great test. That's not to say he's not good at his job, but the person I was asking, I'm like, hey, what do you what do you know about him? He's like, hey, he's a great guy. All right. At yeah. least we got a he's not a bad apple. He's not a bad seed. He's a good guy. So uh look, if he's gonna be in if he's gonna be in baseball this long, I'd like to think he's good at his job. I'd well, like Pedro to think Griffal was a baseball lifer, didn't equate to necessarily a great manager so far. Well, maybe he wasn't meant to be a manager, but no, well, the jury is still out on that. Is it though? Uh, yes, it is. Let's let's just. I don't know. Okay, that's not the topic of the podcast. Tony Gill's laughing over here. Uh, all right, so here we go. Yo, I'm Mankata. I mean, I, I look. I'm gonna for those of you watching. I'm gonna listen to this. Yeah, listen to this. So, uh, if you've listened to this podcast before. And chances are, if you are listening now, this is not your first time listening. But if it is your first time listening, yeah, I've been a little critical of Yoan Mankata and his uh, maximizing his talent. Okay, and yes, he's got a uh, basically the the Sox owe him thirty million dollars 
total left on his contract for one year because there's a $5 million buyout for um, 2025. And he has not done much. But I want to just say this. I need to be fair when fair is needed. When someone is due for me to at least acknowledge what he's been doing. Last 35 games, this does not count oh, Wednesday's Christ. game. But 30, 35 games, he's slashing 331, 366, slugging 559. Guff, let me finish my point here because we'll get to the end of this and you're not going to think I'm like completely insane. He's raised his batting average from 214 to 262. He ranks fifth in the American League in batting average during these last 35 games. He's reached base safely in 25 of the last 27 games. He homered in three straight games earlier this month. He is looking very much like the Yoa Mankata we thought we were getting in 2019. Am I ready to believe in Yoa Mankata? Hell no! But I want to acknowledge he is playing the best out of anybody other than Luis Robert on this team in the second half offensively. Thoughts? Nothing. Nothing. You want me to comment on this? You don't. Yeah, sure. Comment. Who comment. cares? Wow. Who cares? So, so let me put this together. Yuan Makata, who's done absolutely nothing for two plus years, who has been unreliable. Correct. Uh, both to stay on the field and then while on the field, is ironically having a great month as we head into a off season of many questions and him being maybe as top of the question chain as any of them. And he's trying to go out on a high note to say, look at my, my nine forty OPS in September. Sorry, dude. Well, Sorry. maybe his back is finally better and that has something well, to do with it. And if that's the case, that's great. Mm -hmm. But I'm sick of this shit. I'm sick of going back and sitting there looking at where were you when we needed you? Yeah, I'm done. So I'm not believing in Yohan Makata. Okay. I'm not. I, I, this is Yohan Makata to me. You, know who, you want to know who Yohan Makata is to me? Who is Yohan Makata to you? Yohan Makata is a 260 hitter. 260? I wish. That's what he's hitting now. Okay, good for him. Yeah, good for him. Like, he's got you believing. See, you wish he was a 260 hitter. Uh, no, that's my. that's who he is. He's a 255 hitter. He's for his career? Seven, for his career, he is a 254 hitter with an OPS, a 755 OPS and an OPS plus of 106, which I would still argue is inflated. Um, he's an average player that's getting above average salary because of above average, he's, way above. I know and he's got some of the most talent in baseball. So yeah, uh, I'm not even. About, I won't even give that to him anymore. Well. The best part, maybe for this resurgence, if you want to call it that, from Moncada is maybe, maybe, just maybe, he might be tradable in the off season. Because I hope, yeah. I mean, you're going to get good defense from him, and that you know, this is always in him. I mean, he could have a month like this, but maybe it's somewhere else. You know, I, I listen. I uh, I try to be fair, and yes, it's no, it's he's like sour. It's like sour grapes. Like he's doing this when the team is on the verge of losing 100 games. So it does mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. But at the very least, we're finally seeing Yo Mankata playing and looking like the player we thought was in there and the player we thought we were going to get for like eight years. And we've got it for like, we've had it for like three months in the last eight years. And that's again, like, so what? Like, let's say he comes out in April next year and and here it's like wait here we go and then his back flares up yeah it's yeah. cold and can't rely on he, him he you know he strains an oblique because he's overdoing it he's this chuck his his story has been written in chicago <laughs> maybe 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 he's, you think got, he's back next year if it were me there are three people that well if it were me i would strongly consider strongly consider coming to glendale Without Yoan Mankato, Aloy Jimenez, and Tim Anderson. Mm. And so, what are you doing with Mankata? You trading him? Are you? Just... Well, you're trying to trade everyone. Yeah. And you know, look, the other teams. The, 
the other 29 teams are sitting there going, we know everything we need to know about you, Omar mm-hmm. And if you can trade them, yes. I mean, if you can get Mankata off your books and you have to eat 20 of the 29, at least you're not eating all of it. Yeah, you know what I'll say? Like, if there's a team out there, and I haven't looked into it, if there's a team out there that's got a good core, right, and they need a third baseman, just give me some good third base and whatever we get offensively, great. They're the team that could use Yoel Moncada next year. You know, a team uh, here's a team that I think that could, that would be good for Yoel Moncada. I, and I don't, I don't. This is with me like not really knowing the roster, but like the team like the Brewers to me are a team that like Moncada would make a lot of sense on mm-hmm. because they have the plan, they have the blueprint, they know exactly how to win. They have strong pitching. They have other guys to rely on. And they could bring it, plop and play him. That's how those. That's where Yoan Mankata needs to go. He needs to go to a plug and play, where he's not the number one prospect in baseball, a key part of the rebuild, one of the guys that signed a contract. No one gives a crap about that when he goes to another team. Yeah, he'll he's just, just be another be, third baseman who's got good tools. Yeah, when when whoever trades for or acquires Yoan Mankata. It's it, the only thing that'll be tied to him is former top prospect, former, former, former. It's not going to mm-hmm. say, it's not going to be like all star, gold glove. No, none of that stuff's going to come with him. They're all going to say, like, this guy at one point was this and he was traded for Chris Sale. But his story in Chicago, Chuck, in my opinion, if he's back, I don't know. Like, I, I've said this on other podcasts that I think you need to maybe, maybe the money you spend in 2024 is to rid of your rest of the bad apples in 2023. Yeah. And that may be unfair. Maybe, maybe I, whatever, maybe Tim or a lawyer, or Johan would come to me and say like, what, what? look, this isn't unsourced or on, this isn't, we know like all of these guys could be, really benefit for different reasons from, by, from a fresh start. Yeah. Every one of them. And, and, and the, White Sox, the White Sox too. And the White Sox could benefit from a fresh start as well. But you're gonna wrap up what? Can, just for the record, yeah. I'm not believing in you on my cut. You can. No, I was bringing up the question and I said, no, you I can. do not believe I'm not believing in them, <laughs> but I wanted to at least talk about it. And I don't. I will say uh, the last the last thing I'll say about Mankata, watching him homer. You still get those that 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 tease of just how effortless it, it is. Yes, you know, like the home oh run in Washington, and it's like four twenty or whatever, and it's just it, it's like it might it's be the easiest power on the team. It's yeah. just yeah. It, it, again, it's frustrating. It's just frustrating. That's that's the that's the Mankata. Let's sum it up in one word: frustrating. Frustration. Mankata frustration. All right, going to wrap up the podcast with uh, something that, you know, on the pre and post game shows, uh, started doing this thing this year. Best thing in the show, worst thing in the show. Uh, here's the best thing in the podcast, which is also the worst thing in the podcast. Um, on the pregame show on Wednesday, I said that I did not believe that it was possible for Lenin Sosa to draw a walk because he had 35 strikeouts and one walk this year, and it was an intentional walk. I don't know if people realize that. Lenin Sosa, I'm going to repeat this, had 35 strikeouts and one walk. All right? This person does not belong in the major leagues, even if it's September. And you have played discipline like that? Where, like, talk about player development. I mean, I would talk to Chris Getz about that. Like, how did this happen? He's got zero plate discipline in the major leagues. It wasn't this bad in the minor leagues. So is it coaching up here? Is it coaching down there? Is it Lenin Sosa? Is there a lack of other prospects? Is it all the above? Anyway, so I said this on the pregame show. He did not have a single legitimate walk all year long in the major leagues with the White Sox. He drew a walk (laughs) in the game on five pitches. Lenin Sosa now has two walks to go with 35 strikeouts. What is wrong with the White Sox? Lenin Sosa is a perfect example. You need some depth in your minor league system. Who do you have to bring up? It's Sosa. I know it sounds like I'm just absolutely annihilating him, but when you talk about a a system right now that is broken, you have a guy who comes up and gives you 35 strikeouts and one legitimate walk. That is not going to win baseball games. That's just someone who's going up there hacking and has zero approach, or he might have an approach he does not know how to execute, and that has got to change. 
a thousand percent, but the accountability does as well. Yeah. You can't hold you can't hold you can't put Lenin Sosa in a bucket and not put the and not put the other guys in it too. So I don't I don't know. I'm not gonna make an excuse for Lenin Sosa because he does look like he goes up there sometimes without a plan. Kind of like the way Oscar Colas plays baseball. But if you've been benched or been called out by your manager because of something you did that somebody else is also doing, you might go up there thinking like you got no shot anyway. And you're like, this is survival. So I don't know. It's got to change. I heard you're on the pregame show the other day talking about the three things that must change for next year. And that'd be, mm -hmm. that's a major, it's not, that's up and down the lineup. So baseball's funny though. The fact that you called it out and then the guy walks, it's just, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's literally, that's the beauty, man. I, I love it. it. It's so great that here you are conning, uh, what are the odds? One. What literally are the odds? I mean, the percentages are right there. He had walked once. He had a 35 to one strikeout to walk ratio, and it really was 35 to nothing because of the intentional walk. So the odds are right there for you. I yeah, mean, but I wouldn't say he was due because no, he was never no, going to do it. I'm saying the odds are very against him that he's going to draw a walk since he had not done that at all this season. No, and, and I didn't look it up, but why would someone intentionally walk Lenin Sosa? I have no idea. Yeah, like that's Tony, the guy you want to face. Something. Yeah, I want to go back and look at when that happened because that might be a White Sox win that day. Hey, yeah, I want to add uh, something before we take off. Yeah, uh, I I want to, and for those who don't already know, but I want to congratulate Chuck and everybody with us at the White Sox, um, and with our crew. But uh, long overdue, and and hopefully it leads to a, a much deserved long overdue win. But Sox pre and post, both the pregame show and the postgame show, separate entities. We're both nominated for a, a regional sports Emmy uh, as we taped this. That was, that was on Tuesday night. Ozzy's also nominated in the analyst category, which his, his comments were great. He's the best in Chicago. We're lucky to have him. The trophy, he said, would mean more to him than any other trophy he's ever won. Think about that, 2005. Uh, but, Chuck, seriously, um, I wanted to say something to you as your friend on this podcast and certainly a guy who has uh, literally given everything if, if, in your career – I watch you do this job admirably as a friend and in a season like this to get that kind of news, I feel like it's very rewarding because this has been the, you know, the, the longest 60 months of my, of our lives. Oh, it's six <laughs> months. Uh, and to, it, it, and hopefully it leads to success, but you and I know how this game works. Uh, sometimes the nomination is, is, is more than enough, but congratulations, brother. You deserve it. That show is the best in, on TV, uh, not just in Chicago, but coast to coast. And uh, I'm glad that you guys were acknowledged for it. Oh, thanks, Gup. That means a lot. I appreciate it. Yeah, we we put a lot of uh, time and effort into the show. Uh, winning games, winning postgame shows are the easiest to do because the Sox, the team, has just provided you with your easy show. Uh, easiest thing to do is talk about a win. Toughest thing to do is talk about a loss and get people to watch it. Stay tuned and watch it and like it and enjoy it. And hopefully be entertained by it. So uh, I credit uh, everyone who works on the show. Jason Schwartz is our primary producer. Uh, Ozzy's great. Frank, Gordon, Pods. I mean, I'm really lucky, the guys that I get to work with, right? Yep. Um, uh, NBC Sports Chicago, who let me, you know, they have just basically given us a, a blank canvas to do what we want to do. And I'm going to credit the White Sox because we have been pretty critical, pretty yeah. critical borderline yeah. very critical of them and rightfully so for the way that they've played i've not heard one thing from the white Sox about what we have said they have we've had to like wear it right on the air and they've they've worn it by what we've said uh so in a, in a way we're all in this together the white Sox and us um we all i want the white Sox to do well the white Sox clearly do uh, but when things go south, I mean, we cannot BS the fans. We cannot do that. Um, you know, and so we try to sp speak from, speak our truth and be authentic and tell you what we see and what we're not seeing. I've always said, and I'll do it again next year. I mean, if they have a bad April, I'm going to, I'm not going to, you know, light a fire. I'm not going to go crazy about it. Even in May, I wait till about June because baseball season's, you know, take a lot of different directions, and I'm not going to do that because it's a tough game to play. But listen, uh, we are now approaching 100 losses. It's likely going to happen, and things have 
thing it's, it's going to happen. Things have to be said. Things have got to be said. And I mean, unfortunately, you never you, you like to hear this, but you don't want to hear it. Uh, I've, but we've been hearing all year long, me, Ozzy, Frank, that they don't want to watch the games. They just watch the post game shows to hear what we say, which is that's great perfect. for us. But yep. it's it's that's that's not what this is about. And that's that's no, you know, that that and that's where the White Sox are at. And that has got to change. And Chris Getz and everybody are responsible for changing it. And I hope they, they can do it. And we'll have uh, more winning shows uh, in the future. Oh, man. From your mouth to God's ears. Yeah. All right. That's a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to their special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. I don't know if the Hawk Harrelson podcast is going to happen. I mean, he's in. <laughs> but he's so elusive right now. And people are like texting me and sending me messages. You got to get Hawk on the pod. He's, he wants to do it, but like Hawks, uh, he's, if he's not watching Walker, Texas Ranger or Gunsmoke, Gunsmoke. He's on, yeah, Gunsmoke, Gunsmoke. Yeah. I mean, I might just have to just find out his address, drive to Granger and just knock on his door. That, that might be the best way to do it. Should I just do that? Should I just do that? that? Might be the best way. I mean, but, maybe I'll shoot him a text too. big like, Hawk. Come on, man. That's, Come on. I just I'm gonna I might just be like, hey Hawk, I'm coming to your house. What's your address? He actually might I might just do that. that. But so so when the White Sox season ends, and if I cannot get this thing done, uh, I, that that road would trip. be a hilarious road trip. I mean, because it, it was funny because like when I saw him, I saw him in person at a, a White Sox the White Sox golf outing, and I'm like, everyone's been asking me we, to do a podcast, and like the thing is, he'll call me. Oh, no, no. He normally texts me. He called me once and we had a long conversation. He texted me, texted me a lot. I will call him right back and goes right to voicemail and you in the voice mailbox is full. And I'll say then I'll text him. Hey, I want to get you on the podcast. No response. So I said, what are you doing? And he goes, that's how I like it. That's what I'm doing. He's like playing a game with me. And he it's goes, so. So then he go, I go, well, let's do the podcast. It's raining. This golf is not going to happen. And he goes, okay let's, okay, let's do the podcast. And then the golf outing did happen, so I couldn't do it. And he goes, well, look, I don't want you to come out to Granger and do it. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go to Granger either. But Guff, we might have to. Chuck, let's do it. We go to Granger, then we can go to uh, we got a lake house out there. Hey. All right. Maybe we parlay that into a Hawk. I'll go with you. We'll do a okay. Hawk podcast. And then you and I will take the boat out one last time before it goes out. All right. Okay, well, I'll have to get his address, and we should just surprise him. Get it done. Let's do it in early October. All right. Hawk! We're coming. Take it, take it away, man. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.